Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTO course entitled Twentieth Century Fiction, where we'll begin with a new text today. We just finished looking at uh, Captain Mansfield's short story, The Fly, and we start a new short story today, which is uh, Solid Objects by uh, Virginia Woolf. Uh, before I move into this uh, text of the story, as I will in a few minutes, uh, just a few, um, uh, a little bit of time should be spent talking about this story in general and how to locate it in the entire aesthetics of modernism, uh, because you know, as we can see, twentieth um, century fiction is largely classified as that modernist period in literature and we'll have, uh, we already have discussions about some of the characteristics of that period. I will continue to go back to those um, uh, points over and over again into the course of this particular uh, lecture and also later. Now, uh, one of the key things about modernism as we saw about uh, and, and explicitly described in James Charles' Ulysses, also in his Dubliners and also before in Eliot's early poetry is the entire uh, almost obsession with consciousness uh, in terms of this inward looking gaze where uh, the character's actions are less important than the character's thoughts and sometimes thoughts, uh, uh, they, they replace actions entirely. So if you take a look at for instance Ulysses by James Joyce, the entire novel is about uh, not so much about human motor movements which are there, very much there in Ulysses, uh, Leopold Bloom hops across Dublin entirely, but also about uh, the mental movements uh, going back and across time. Uh, cutting back and across time. So the entire idea, the entire notion, the entire experience of space-time space gets uh, really problematized in modernism. And as we know, uh, this is also the time uh, in physics where the Newtonian laws of physics are being replaced by the Einsteinian laws of physics, right? So everything becomes relative, uh, psychological. So you know, the relativity of the universe uh, gets uh, uh, represented in fiction uh, in many ways in modernism. Now, as far as this particular story is concerned, we find that the first striking thing about the story is the visual narrative, the visual representation, the visual form of representation that uh, Wolf uses, which is quite cinematic in quality. We saw that already in Wolf's uh, uh, Mrs. Jalloway, where, for instance, uh, Septimus Smith walks across uh, London, Peter Walsh walks across London, and the movements uh, that they experience around them are very similar to the montage movements uh, in early cinema, which is obviously something that Wolf was aware of, as was Eliot, as was Joyce, as was uh, most of the major modernists, because cinema was coming up in a big way uh, during modernism. Uh, it was very much a c part of cultural modernity. Uh, it was very much part of uh, the technology of modernity, the technology, the visual uh, narrative of modernity was largely informed by cinema and cinematic modes of representation. And we see that cinematic quality early on in this particular uh, story, as we'll see in a moment when we begin reading it. But you know, there's this long shot which where the story opens, uh, a very, very long shot which uh, t shows us very two small specks in a huge, a massive sea beach. Uh, and then we see closer, the shot gets closer and closer until we come to the close up and we find th these are two men walking down a sea beach discussing politics. Uh, now, there is a bizarre Kafkaesque quality about the story, which is interesting because this is quite unlike uh, many stories that Wolf wrote, most stories that Wolf wrote. Uh, it's about quote unquote an irrational human behavior. And the irrationality is important for us to locate because it, in a way, it, it becomes a parody of the political rationality it becomes a parody of the rationality informing uh, British politics at that time. So the irrationality becomes some kind of a romantic escape, which is seen as a very bizarre narrative in the story. Right, so the strange, bizarre, uncanny quality, uh, the irrational quality in the story is exactly what we should be looking at uh, in terms of examination of this as a modernist uh, artwork, because it is quite literally uh, you know, a work of art, this particular story. Now, the very title of the story, Solid Objects, it is ironical in quality because as you can see, uh, as you will see when we read the story, uh, it is more a story about fragility and fetish. Uh, and I've got a conference paper on this which I read many years ago. It is exactly about fetish and fragility on this particular short story. So if, you, uh, you know, if you're keen on reading the conference paper, do email me on that platform that we have. I'm happy to uh, share that with you. Uh, and that was something which uh, examined the whole entanglement of fetish and fragility because you know 
the fetish in the story is about fragility. So he's someone, the, the character in the story is someone who becomes obsessed uh, with broken objects, with uh, half uh, broken objects, with abundant objects and that becomes important for us because the whole idea of abundant objects becomes a very important uh, signifier of modernity. Uh, objects which are now useless, which are post use, uh, post uh, commodity, to co commodification, a post purpose, right? And a post purpose quality is something which we uh, are keen on because you know we have on the one hand a story about uh, a would be politician, uh, someone who has political ambitions, but that ambition gets replaced in the story. Instead, what happens is he becomes essentially a rack picker, he goes around London picking up broken objects. Right, and that post value, the post purpose quality of all these objects is exactly what gets what, what gets mapped onto his political career as well, because his political career gets completely, uh, you know, sidelined. Uh, and by the time the story ends, it is all but done. It's all but uh, you know relinquished the political ambitions that he has uh, had at some point before. Uh, so this story is about the uh, fragility and the fetish about fragility, uh, which is uh, something that is embodied by this very strange character uh, called John. Now, before we move on, there's something which uh, you know we need to contextualize the story. Of course, there are any work of art, any work of fiction uh, needs to be located uh, in a cultural setting of its times. Now, one brilliant book that I recommend. Uh, looking at the entire idea of the object, the entire experience of the object in modernity uh, is actually called Solid Objects, uh, which is by uh, Douglas Mao, uh, a major modernist scholar. Uh, so obviously Mao draws on this uh, story by Wolf uh, and is published by Princeton University Press. If you Google up Douglas Mao, uh, Solid Objects, which is entirely about the uh, politics of production and modernity. Uh, so the whole idea of what gets, what is worthy of production, uh, what is worthy of consumption, what is worthy of uh, reproduction and modernity is what Mao talks about. Now, this story, on the other hand, I mean, obviously Mao draws on the story uh, literally and quite uh, ironically in, in his uh, brilliant work on the idea of machines and you know materials in modernity. This story is actually about abundant objects, right? So it's about post commodification objects which have. Uh, run their course in terms of the commodity value, uh, objects which are you know, decommodified now, objects which are you know, non-purposeful now. And this whole idea of post-purpose, which I mentioned a little while ago, is like I said, the materiality of post-purpose is mapped onto uh, the politics of post-purpose because you know what we see in the story is someone giving up on his political dream, uh, someone relinquishing, someone just completely ignoring his political dream and, and, and instead becoming obsessed uh, with solid objects, which, with, with broken objects, with shattered objects, right? And also, uh, we need to understand this is a story written uh, around the First World War. Uh, so, uh, finding lots of broken objects in London uh, was actually quite uh, you know, easy because it was a very heavily bombed site. And in you know, the First World War and then the Second World War, uh, it essentially shattered London uh, you know, in terms of its architecture. Lots of buildings were broken, uh, bombed heavily, uh, and the heavy bombing of buildings, the heavy bombing of materials, uh, in a way, produced uh, shattered objects. So, in a way, interestingly, what we see here is the production of abundant objects, the production of post commodification, uh, which is something which is caused by the war. Uh, because the war, uh, with this bombing, the war with its destruction, it produces things which uh, you know becomes post commodity. Uh, so in a way, you can put it in say, in, by, by saying that it becomes the production of purposelessness, right? And th what I'd like to do in this lecture is map this production of purposelessness onto uh, the more human production of purposelessness, which we saw in Mrs. Dalloway, where Septimus Smith, who was once this purposeful, productive man. Uh, now finds himself completely abundant, uh, existentially, medically, biologically, emotionally. Uh, so he, in a way, becomes uh, a post-production man, uh, a post-purpose man. So the purposelessness of Septimus Smith and a purposelessness of the objects over here in this particular short story could be very interestingly mapped onto each other. And that's something that you know some of you might uh, want to do more research on this, and that's one idea that you can uh, reasonably pursue, I think. So, uh, this is the background of the story, it is about the obsession, the, the fetish about fragility, the fetish about uh, uh, broken objects and how that uh, you know, in a way consumes the person, right? And that brings me to the other important point which I want to talk a little bit about today, the whole idea of consumption, the whole experience of consumption. Now, what we see here is, uh, it becomes an act of irrational consumption. Uh, 
uh, somebody who's not consuming uh, the rational things, not consuming the consumable things, quote unquote consumable things, but rather uh, someone who's actually wanting or aspiring uh, to consume broken things, shattered things, abundant things. And the whole idea of abundant projects, uh, his own political career being one supreme example, he abandons that project, he abandons that idea of becoming a politician. Uh, that obviously is get, gets mapped into more metonymically uh, into all the different abundant objects that he's collecting all the time. But the bigger narrative here is, you know, the whole idea uh, of, you know, entangling yourself emotionally uh, with things which don't have any utility, that becomes important over here. And that obviously becomes a critique in a certain way of the very uh, utilitarian uh, principles of modernity where everything has a value, everything has a commodity a signifier, everything has a price tag, everything has a purpose. Uh, so the purposelessness, the irrationality of this principal character, the protagonist in the story becomes a very uh, interesting commentary, uh, perhaps a criticism uh, or critique rather uh, of uh, the entire uh, you know, commodity driven uh, obsession with objects that modernity had. So therein lies the Kafka's quality of the story uh, where you know the, uh, the obsession with broken objects, obsession with purposeless objects, objects obsession with uh, shattered objects, uh, those, actually, that obsession actually becomes a critique of the obsession with uh, consume, uh, you know, consumption in modernity, right? So the act of consumption becomes important. So uh, the protagonist over here becomes an uh, irrational consumer. Uh, which is obviously um, a critique of the idea of rational consumption in modernity. And again, if you compare this and contrast and compare this and have a nice dialogue study with, let's say, um, Mrs. Dalloway, we find that in the whole idea of masculinity as embodied by uh, Septima Smith, and this is again, this story is also about masculinity because we have two men uh, who want to become politicians. So, you know, the whole idea of political masculinity uh, gets uh, critiqued away, uh, gets parodied away. Uh, now, in Septimus Smith's case, in Mr. Jalloway, uh, it's about military masculinity and it's about medical masculinity and how there is a degree of collusion between medical masculinity and military masculinity in terms of the uh, biopolitics represented by the doctors, uh, uh, Holmes and Bradshaw, right? Now, Holmes, Bradshaw, the political figures over here uh, in this particular story, they all could be aligned together as principal, uh, you know, masculinist figures. Uh, uh, and those are figures which are critiqued, those are figures which are parodied sometimes, those are figures which are looked at as enemies of the true existential self uh, by Wolf. And in, in the case of Septimus Smith and Mrs. Jalloway, we see how Holmes and Bradshaw essentially drive Septimus to suicide, to killing himself, uh, because they pound upon him, you know, they completely uh, coerce him and consume him in that sense. Now, in this story, we have this character who is on his way to become a politician, but then he develops this bizarre fascination, this bizarre fetish uh, for you know, collecting broken objects. And that fetish uh, essentially consumes him. So that, in a way, as I mentioned, that becomes a very interesting um, critique of consumption in modernity. Right? So what you consume, consumes you back. Right? So this particular uh, uncanny act of consumption, in a way, uh, becomes an extreme example, extreme uh, sort of visual example of the uncanny, needless, purposeless consumption of modernity, right? So, which is something which is critiqued over and over again. Uh, the act of consumption in modernity, you know, in a way that, you know, what you consume, consume you back, right? And uh, the, ir the irrational consumption in this particular story is actually a critique, an oblique critique of the irrational consumption in modernity as well. Because what you consume rationally also consumes you back. And in a way, uh, the difference between the consumer and the consumed blurs away. Uh, as we could see, uh, for instance, in this very infamous, or famous rather, uh, episode in uh, Elliot's Wasteland, which we studied in great details, uh, the fire sermon section of Wasteland, where the typewriter and uh, the, the, the typist, sorry, the typist and the clerk, they have this loveless sex with each other. And amidst this lovelessness, uh, you know, the difference between a man and a machine blurs away completely because the act of, you know, the, 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 the act of, uh, you know, loveless sex becomes completely machinic in quality. Uh, and at some point, as we saw in this particular episode, when the clerk goes away, you know, uh, the, the typist, uh, she allows a half from uh, thought to pass her brains. And then she puts an automatic hand and puts an automatic record on a gramophone. So the hand becomes automatic, as we mentioned at that point. Uh, so again, the whole act of consuming music through gramophone, uh, in a way, makes you machinic in quality. So in a way, that consumes you back in quality as well. So the act of consumption in this particular story is irrational, uncanny, 
uh, and almost erotic in quality as well because you know he's sort of into lots of fetish uh, for broken objects as we see and sometimes he uh, puts himself in risk socially uh, he goes through uh, shame uh, it goes through a degree of ostracization as well. Everyone starts avoiding him, the principal character in the story. Uh, but that doesn't um, dampen his spirits in terms of going about and collecting things over and over again. Right, so this is the long shot of the story. This is the thematic background, the cultural background, the political background against which the story is written and should be situated. So with that, we move into this text and see how it develops in the codes. So this is Solid Objects by Virginia Woolf and this should be on your screen. The only thing that moved upon the vast semicircle of the beach was one small black spot. As it came nearer to the ribs and spine of the stranded pilchard boat, it became apparent from a certain uh, tenuity in its blackness that this spot possessed four legs. And moment by moment, it became more unmistakable that it was composed of the persons of two young men. Even thus, in outline against the sand, there was an unmistakable vitality in them, an indescribable vigour in the approach and withdrawal of the bodies, slight though it was, which proclaimed some violent argument issuing from the tiny mouths of the tiny little round heads. This was corroborated on closer view by the repeated lunging of a walking stick on the right hand side. You, you mean to tell, tell me you actually believe it? There's a walking stick on the right hand side next to the waves seem to be asserting as it cut long straight stripes upon the sand. Now as I mentioned the story begins with a long shot. It has a huge long shot uh, where it just shows you one dot, one little black dot and then it moves closer to the dot and then we see it has limbs, uh, four different limbs, so two different sets of limbs and then it moves closer, even closer and we realize those are two different men. Uh, they're walking together uh, almost in sync with each other uh, uh, across the beach and then we see we get even closer, we hear the animated discussion they're having and also the uh, walking stick they're using as they walk uh, and of course the walking stick is used to assert arguments, right, to make uh, uh, shapes in the sand as they're walking down. Okay, so tiny mouths, little round heads, so all these become more visible uh, as the camera moves in closer. So we can see how uh, the, the focalization done in the story is very cinematic in quality, right? So it moves towards the uh, uh, hands and lips at the end, but at the beginning it was a complete long shot, almost a panoramic shot, uh, a top shot, a panoramic shot across the entire wilderness of the sand. Uh, in which the uh, two human beings blend together in one little dot and then of course it becomes clearer to us that they are two different persons, two different men with limbs and uh, you know, other kinds of human bodies, uh, other human organs as well and they're having a discussion presumably uh, about uh, something profound, something intellectual, probably something political as we know. But there's a disagreement that's happening. Okay, so I'm going to just hear snippets in the conversation. You mean to tell me you actually believe uh, that the walking stick on the right hand side next to the wave seemed to be asserting as it cut long straight stripes upon the sand? Politics be damned. Issued clearly from the body of the left hand side, and as those words were uttered, the mouths, noses, chins, little mustaches, tweed caps, rough boots, shooting coats, and check stockings of the two speakers became clearer and clearer. The smoke of the pipes went up into the air. Nothing, nothing was so solid, so living, so hard, red, hirsute and virile as those two bodies from miles and miles of sea and sand held. So again, uh, now we can see a very, very interesting close-up of the two bodies. You can see the mouth, noses, chins, mustaches, tweed caps, rough boots, everything can be seen uh, uh, through certain metonymic signifiers. So the, the close-up now uh, replaces uh, the long shot and we see a closer look uh, the two men and the smoke of the pipes too coming out of the uh, you know the act of smoking uh, and then we are also told that across the distance these are the only two men available or animated very virile very hard very very um, you know organic in quality and you know everything becomes uh, about them so we can see at the beginning of the story the two men just form a dot so the humanism or the human presence is very insignificant but then the camera moves close up as it were and then we see the two men emerging with all the details, mustaches, tweed caps, uh, boots, uh, smoking pipes, etc. And then that replaces the wilderness and you know, that becomes an important uh, principal situation, the principal scene as it were. Right, they flung themselves down by six ribs and spine of the black pilchard boat. You know how the body seems to shake itself free from an argument and to apologize for a mood of exaltation, 
flinging itself down and expressing in this, the looseness of his attitude a readiness to take up with uh, something new, whatever it may be that comes next to hand. So we see, uh, again, this is uh, a very detailed description of the body behavior uh, that Wolf is giving us over here. And again, this is something modernists do all the time. They, they talk about the, the human limb movement, the human consciousness, the human uh, body movement, and everything becomes very, very embodied in quality, as you can see. So now Wolf is describing how the human body is exhausted after a long argument and it wants to uh, you know, release itself from the uh, stress of argument and then it flings itself down to a less uh, stressed position, a more relaxed position, which is what they're doing, these two men over here. Right. So Charles, whose stick had been slashing the beach for half a mile or so, began skimming flat pieces of slate over the water. And John, who had exclaimed, politics be damned, began burrowing this finger down, down into the sand, right? So again, the uh, it, almost involuntary movements are described in great detail. So it's taking this walking stick and making burrows in the sand. So almost again, irrational mortal behavior is in uh, action over here. As his hand went further and further beyond the wrist, so that he had to hitch his sleeve a little higher, his eyes lost their intensity, or rather the background of thought and experience, which gives an inscrutable depth to the eyes of grown people, disappeared, leaving only the clear, transparent surface, expressing nothing but wonder which the eyes of young, display, young children display. So again, we have great details of you know, the human eyes away, how the film of maturity goes away from the eyes, and we have a sense of wonder. It's almost naive wonder at something new which begins to emerge in the eyes, which is captured in great details and described to us, right? So, he's not becoming uh, like a little child. Uh, it's displaying the sense of wonder, the amazement of a little child over here. He remembered that after digging a little, digging for a little, the water oozes around your fingertips. The whole then becomes a moat, a well, a spring, a secret channel to the sea, right? So again, um, as it's making a, the hole deeper and deeper in the sand, he realizes how it becomes connected to the sea in a very microcosmic way, right? So uh, he's making a little pool of water, essentially, and that pool is getting connected to the sea. So again, look at the way in which uh, the almost involuntary human movement over here, it creates uh, a sense of connect uh, to the vast wilderness of nature, the sea over here. Or it's just digging the uh, hole in, in, in the sand with this walking stick. Um, and of course, uh, is the water is oozing around the fingertips, which gives an organic sensation. Now, what this scene does essentially is that it connects the organic human body uh, to the vast inanimate nature, uh, the wildness of the sea, the vastness, the infinity of the sea. Right? So, the body is obviously very finite away. It's a finite frame. The fingernails are very small, very metonymic, very tiny. And the tininess of the fingernails is being connected to the vastness of the sea uh, in a seemingly involuntary act of digging hole inside a burrow, uh, digging a burrow in the sand. So, again, look at the very careful attention to details the wolf is displaying over here. And now, obviously, the gaze is very cinematic and it's very, very close up. Uh, the fingernails are shown in great details and the contrast that uh, to the visual grammar with which the story this particular fiction began, which is a long shot of two men walking together as if uh, they're one small dot in a vast wilderness of the sea. Okay, as he was choosing which of these things to make it, uh, still working his fingers in the water, they curl round something hard, a full drop of solid matter. This is the first solid object which comes in the story, and this is the first touch that he has with a solid object which makes him and which creates and develops his fetish that he has subsequently. A full drop of solid matter. Again, look at the interesting uh, description, a full drop of solid matter. And normally, when I talk about solid matter, you don't use the word drop. Drop is liquidy in quality. Uh, but Wolf is obviously uh, describing a very complex tactile experience over here because you know, the fingers are dipping in the sand, which is a part of the sea, and the waters are curled around the sand uh, and the fingers. And amidst all that curling around water, a curl around water, we suddenly touch something solid. So there's something semi solid, something half liquidy about the entire solid object, which makes uh, the word drop very, very interesting as a description over here. A full drop of solid matter. And gradually dislodged a large irregular lump. That's the first object which comes over here, a, a large irregular lump, and brought it to the surface. So the lump surfaced up, it came to the surface. When a sand coating was wiped off, a green tint appeared. It was a lump of glass, so thick as to be almost opaque, right? So this is now the solid object, the first solid object in the story, a lump of glass, uh, which is now uh, so thick as to be opaque. The smoothing of the sea had completely worn off any edge 
or shape. It's a flat piece of glass. Any edge of shape it may have had at one point of time is completely smoothed away by the endless uh, coming in and going of the sea. So it's impossible to say whether it had been bottle, tumbler, or window pane. It was nothing but glass. It was almost a precious stone. Now, this is an interesting bit, and I just want to spend a little bit of time with this because, as you can see, that this piece of glass is impossible to see what this glass was part of initially. Now, it could have been a bottle, it could have been something else, it could have been a uh, you know, window pane, it could have been a tumbler. In other words, it is now post papers. Now, see, which has come and gone uh, over and over again, and which has smoothened it uh, in due course of time. Uh, that had made it essentially and infinitely and perfectly purposeless in quality. Now, the purposelessness is something which is interesting for us to understand because the only, and this is something which we can uh, read very interestingly and very uh, nicely and complexly with thing theory, because the whole idea of seeing something as a thing, purely as a thing, is only possible when the uh, value of that thing or the, uh, the functionality of that object becomes interrupted, uh, gets terminated. So what we see over here is a termination of functionality. So we don't quite know where this glass object had come from, whether it was a part of a tumbler or a piece of glass in a mirror maybe, or maybe a bottle, we don't quite know that. And the non-utility quality, non-utilitarian quality about this glass is what makes it purely a thing, right? So. Uh, in a sense, we can look at this entire story as a human organic engagement with the thing, right? A thing which is completely outside of the human parameter of uh, knowledge, purpose, utility, etc. Uh, so this becomes a very fertile story, a very fertile frame to look at uh, with thing theory. That particular frame is very useful away. And those of you interested in thing theory could look up uh, you know, lots of articles on that and uh, related topics and different parts of different databases. If you're more keen to know mo more about thing theory, do email us, do uh, write on the platform, and I'll be happy to recommend some articles for you. But suffice it to say over here, what happens over here, what is happening here essentially is that this human involvement with something which is purely a thing and not an object, not a commodity, is what makes the story complex, is what generates the irrationality, right? It's this human engagement with non objects. So thing over here is a non-object or rather post-object, a post-commodity. It may have served a purpose at some point in time, but that purpose had run its course, right? And now we have this, um, uh, and it was, an entire encounter happens near the sea. And you know, when I use run its course, it becomes ironically relevant and appropriate because this entire discovery of, an, of a thing, which is not an object and which is not a commodity anymore, happens right by the sea. Okay. It's almost a precious stone. So this glass is not so smooth, uh, it's so purposeless, it's so indescribable in terms of its connection to something bigger that it becomes almost a precious stone. And the word almost is important because we know when the moment you use the word almost, it is not a precious stone, right? It's just an object, a thing, which is not even an object anymore. It's a post object thing. Yet only to enclose it in a rim of gold or pierce it with a wire and it became a jewel, part of a necklace or a dull green light upon a finger. Perhaps, after all, it was really a gem, something worn by a dark princess trailing her finger in the water as she sat in the stern of the boat and listened to the slaves singing as they rowed her across the bay. Okay, now this is interesting because if you read it with racial politics, it becomes very, very complex because, you know, Obviously, the object here is very, very exotic. It's a thing, as I mentioned. It is outside the utility-driven uh, object economy uh, that human beings engage with. So it's purely a thing outside the economy. Now, the moment it becomes outside the economy, it gets it gets very easily located uh, in an exotic human uh, setting. And we have this dark princess uh, in a boat sailed by um, slaves who are singing some exotic song. And that is where the object becomes uh, situated now, outside the white economy of production and consumption. So we have this racial politics very interestingly uh, interwoven with a thing theory politics over here, which is something that we, we should pay some attention on. Because in a moment it becomes post-utility, the moment it becomes post-value, the moment it becomes post-cognition, uh, it gets very easily transferred to a different economy, a more exotic economy of non-white imagination, right? And that, that racialization is interesting over here. And we should spend some time thinking about that in terms of how this politics play against each other. Or the oak sites of a sunk Elizabethan treasure chest had split apart and rolled over and over, over and over, its emeralds had come at last to show. Oh, it goes back in time and, and uh, the Elizabethan treasure chest opens up and obviously we you know Elizabethan treasure chest would be a treasure chest filled with different parts of different uh, ornaments and gems from across the world. 
uh, it becomes quite literally a very exotic space uh, that had opened up and you know it just this, this particular glass piece is probably one of those things in that particular uh, treasure chest. John turned it in his hands, he held it to the light, he held it so its, it's irregular mass blotted out the body and extended uh, right arm uh, of his friend. The green thinned and thickened slightly as it was held against the sky or against the body. It pleased him, it puzzled him, it was so hard, so concentrated, so definite an object compared to the vague sea and the hazy show, right. So the, the objectivity of the object becomes interesting over here, it is a shape. I mean, it's a shapelessness, so to see, I mean, it's a shapelessness of the show. And that gives them some kind of a human uh, uh, connect to that particular thing, right? So, uh, on the one hand, it's something you does not recognize, something that, that could be from anywhere, but at the same time, uh, the tactility, the tactile relationship he has with the thing uh, assures them, gives them something tangible to hold on to, to grip uh, with, uh, amidst this vast vagueness and fluidity of the sea and the show. So the vague and the word vague and the word hazy away are, are interesting for us to locate. Uh, so that that is outside the cognitive can, as it were. Whereas this object, even though it doesn't know what it is, uh, this thing, even if it doesn't know what it is, it gives him some kind of a tactile, uh, tangible uh, marker of meaning, even though he doesn't quite know its historical background, where it came from, etc. Now a sigh disturbed him, profound final, making him aware that his friend Charles had thrown all the flat stones within reach or had come to the conclusion that it was not worthwhile to throw them. They ate the sandwiches side by side. When they had done and were shaking themselves and rising to their feet, John took the lump of glass and looked at it in silence. So again, there is almost an erotic tension developing over here. Uh, was looking at a glass piece and it gets drawn into it as some kind of a fetish formation happening. Charles looked at it too, but he saw immediately that it was not flat and filling his pipe, he said with the energy that dismisses a foolish strain of thoughts to return to what I was saying. So again, he goes back to the earlier conversation, the more rational conversation, the more uh, political conversation, the more acceptable conversation, whereas we know now that his friend John has not drifted into a more irrational, uncanny uh, economy and that uncanny economy is about broken objects, it is about solid objects which are actually non utilitarian. And again, as I mentioned, the post purpose quality of these objects is exactly what makes it so interesting, uh, which makes it uh, such an important critique of the, of the entire politics of production and consumption uh, of modernity, which uh, uh, Charles, the other friend, the more rational friend, uh, is very much a part of with his political ambitions, with his diplomatic ambitions, etc. So the, the story starts with two men uh, who are drifting along the same uh, narrative of political productive ambitions. One of them drifting away from the narrative and finding another narrative which is irrational, uncanny, is entirely about non-production or post-production and how that complicates the entire discourse of production and consumption and modernity. So this story becomes in a way a very Kafkaesque tale. Uh, a Kafka is carnivalesque tale about production and consumption in modernity. Okay, uh, to return to what I was saying, so he goes back to his earlier narratives, uh, narrative and wants to finish it off. He did not see or if he had seen would hardly have noticed that John after looking at the lump for a moment as if in hesitation slipped it inside his pocket. So this becomes the first act. Uh, almost kleptomaniac in quality, uh, almost erotic in quality, stealthy in quality of taking a solid object and slipping into his pocket as some kind of a fetish. Uh, and obviously, this is the beginning of the fetish, this is the formation of the fetish which happens uh, in due course in the story. So, you know, Charles did not see it, that John had slipped it in his, in his pocket. That impulse too had, may have been an impulse which leads the child to pick up one pebble on a path strewn with them, promising it a life of warmth and security upon a nursery mantelpiece, delighting uh, in a sense of power and benignity with which such action confers and believing that the heart of the stone leaps with joy when it sees itself chosen from a million like it, to enjoy this bliss instead of a life of cold and wet upon the high road. It might so easily have been any other than millions of stones, but it was I, I, I. So I stop at this point now uh, because this is a bit of an unpacking. Now, what Wolf is doing here is interesting because it's it's almost she's almost giving a voice to an inanimate object. So, and this is exactly what thing theory uh, tells us today. Because you know, if you look at thing as something outside the human radar, not as objects, not as commodities, but things which lie outside the human uh, radar of recognizability, uh, the human radar of cognition. Uh, so this interesting uh, essay that you should all read is called Can the Sofa Speak? 
uh, which is obviously uh, uh, draws on can the subaltern speak. But the point is, uh, can things speak for themselves? Or can speak? Can things only speak mediated by human narratives over here? Now, what Wolf does over here is interesting because what she's telling us is this childlike slash childish quality that John is exhibiting by picking up this little solid object and slipping it inside his pocket to take it home and exhibit it later, maybe or consume it visually later, uh, almost in a very kleptomaniacal kind of a way. From that object's perspective, from the thing's perspective, this becomes an excitement because this gets chosen by a human being. Uh, and uh, this is how a thing enters the human radar, the thing enters or uh, re-enters rather the human economy because as you know from this particular object, this may have been a part of a broken thing uh, which was presumably used by human beings at some point of time. So in a way, it has post value, uh, post production, post consumption. Now to re-enter uh, the uh, economy of consumption is something of a delight uh, for this particular thing. So in, in a way, um, the voice over here, it was I, 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 it's almost as if when a stone gets picked up by a child, a whimsical child, the randomness is celebrated, randomness with which a particular stone gets picked up, uh, you know, above and among the other stones. That becomes the moment of celebration for the stone and Wolf is almost, almost giving a voice to the stone over here, in a way which is very, very interesting. So from a stone's perspective, being chosen by a whimsical child among millions of stones becomes an act of celebration uh, and in a way that gives voice to the thing which now becomes an object which may or may not become a commodity or a gift value, right. So therein lies the very complex politics of commodification, value formation and fetish formation which the story particular, this particular short story uh, in a really problematically engages with as we'll see in due course of time. So I'll stop at this point today, we'll continue with this entire politics of production, consumption, and fetish formation uh, as we move on in due course. So I'll continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.